Hello and welcome to a new episode of Other Record Labels. I'm your host, Scott Orr, where we talk about the art and culture of running an independent record label. And today is another one, uh, another episode in our Industry Insider series, where we talk with people in the music industry who don't necessarily run record labels, but who are important to record labels and are helpful to record labels and are meaningful to record labels. And today is uh, one of my favorite uh, interviews I've, I've got to do in, in, the, in the past couple of years. I always love talking to authors. Um, they're so well informed. They're so well spoken, let's be honest. Um, today I talk with Kella Facena, who wrote this incredible book called Major Labels, a history of popular music in seven genres. He talks about rock, R&B, country, punk, hip hop, dance, and pop. I read this book a couple of months ago. As, as I was maybe a quarter of the way through it, I thought I need to get this guy on my show. And after a little bit of research, I found him and he came on the show. And I think you're going to find this so helpful. And, and you know, history is something that we can learn from, obviously. And I think it really informs how we operate. It also, uh, and we're going to talk about this next week, but it also informs how we maybe we don't want to, want to operate, how we want to do something different than how they did it back in the past. You can get yourself a copy of this book by going to otherrecordlabels.com slash books. That's otherrecordlabels.com slash books, where I list all of my favorite books. And this book has been up there for the past couple of months because I think it's something you should really check out. Um, it's a great read. It's a little bit of like a memoir also mixed in with a, an encyclopedia. So it's it's a, it's a really fun book to read and you'll find it super helpful as well as uh, this interview. I hope you find super helpful. Uh, a couple of months ago, I interviewed a record store owner and I asked him uh, if clerks at record stores silently judge the purchases that uh, us customers make, because I always feel like they do, or mm -hmm. at least I'm, I'm insecure. And what is it about our personal music tastes that are so personal and so meaningful? Uh, it's a source of pride, but also something we're, we're often self-conscious about. Well, I would say it's not just that our music tastes are personal. It's that our music tastes are social. I think mm, that's what yeah. makes the fear of judgment that much greater. Hmm. So in other words, when you're being judged, it's not like, oh, maybe you like something bad. The fear is like, oh, maybe you like something that bad people like. <laughs> Maybe you like something that people who aren't cool like. like right. Or maybe my own musical tastes reflect my own judgments about other people and what they like. There's something, not just the fact that often you listen to music at a concert, but the fact that music often reflects our lives, the fact that music is often tribal or segregated mm -hmm. in the ways that our lives can be tribal or segregated. I think that, and the fact that it's experienced in real time, I think that means that often at least I've found when I'm listening to music, often I'm thinking about other people. And that's why those those judgments maybe feel harsh in the way that, you know, saying you like a painting and someone else doesn't like the painting, maybe that wouldn't feel like a harsh judgment in the same way because it wouldn't be linked to this notion of cool right. in the same way. And I, I've got to say, you know, I, I've spent some time behind the counter at, at, at record stores. Um, <laughs> and... It's tricky, right? It, it, and the, the reason it's tricky isn't that, at least not for me, it's not as if someone was coming in and buying a CD and I like wanted to say something snarky. <laughs> no, it's that someone was coming in and asking about music and they would want me to share their passion for it, yes, right? So it's yes. not just like, oh, where do I find the new Seven Mary Three album or whatever. It's like, oh, the new Seven Mary Three album. They're amazing. Yeah. Don't you love them? <laughs> yeah. That's the moment that's tricky. And then as someone behind the counter, you know, I, I you try to find a way to say, uh, to be honest mm. and kind at the same time and be like, well, no, I don't love it, but it's okay because people love different things and we can all agree to disagree, even though deep down, I do believe that the stuff that you love that I don't love is bad, but yeah. only because that's what it means to love music that's and we can right. never quite let go yeah. of that. Yeah. And I assume that you like some stuff that I don't like and you think that some of the stuff I like is also bad. But it's hard to it's hard to put all of that into a phrase and have it not sound <laughs> Condescending, condescending, right? Like, agree to disagree is yeah. a very condescending yeah. phrase. And again, partly condescending because it's not true. Like, mm. we're not, <laughs> you know, we do judge people. We do yeah. tend to have strong feelings about the music we like and the music we don't like. And one of the funny things about that is that in my experience, you know, people that are lucky enough to get to listen to music and write about music for a living, 
tend to have judgments that are a little less harsh, a little less categorical mm. than other people, right? Mm. You talk to a, a civilian who's not lucky enough to <laughs> listen to music for a living, and they'll come out with all sorts of hot takes, right? <laughs> they'll be like, Nirvana is terrible, right? <laughs> they'll be like, I always hated Whitney Houston. That's I don't right. get it. Right. They'll write right. off entire genres. Techno is the worst. I don't know how anyone can listen yeah. to country music. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that, that impulse, which people associate with the elite, people associate that mm. with... Um, you know, music critics or, or people who work at record stores who are, none of them are necessarily part of the financial elite, but they, you know, they seem like part of the cultural elite. But I think that's actually a very populist way to respond to music and something that a lot of people share. Do you, do music genres bring people together or do these new ever narrowing micro genres separate us further? It's a good question. Usually it's a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think what's fun about music is that it does both. Is yeah. that it it can it can form us into groups, into communities. You know, I wrote this book and I I kind of divided music into seven genres, and and my argument was that a musical genre really is a community, and mm -hmm. like any community, it works based on a combination of inclusion and exclusion. You kind of need both of those things to create a community, and sometimes. Sometimes the exclusion is really explicit, right? Like with with punks, punks love to yeah, you know to yeah, excommunicate yeah. people and the idea of like, well, Green Day signed to a major label and they can't play the Gilman anymore because like they're yeah, not underground. Right. And then other genres claim to be more all embracing, right? Like you think of disco and the idea is like everyone's welcome on the dance floor. But it's not a coincidence that like disco is the genre that is the most closely related to actual gatekeepers, right? right? Like disco is linked to like, you know, whether it's the early days at the loft and you had to have a membership card or, you know, Studio 54 and the idea of a bouncer keeping some people out. So usually what, what you discover is that even if your genre claims to be all welcoming, you know, usually you have to have some way of figuring out who's in and who's out. Sometimes the genres that seem to have fewer rules, like R&B, right, which is black music mm. traditionally, but it's not necessarily narrowly defined, and people don't necessarily get written out of the R&B movement exactly. Um, even they, the way, you know, they're not publishing manifestos the way, the way punks do. <laughs> Even there, you saw with Whitney Houston, um, you know, the painful experience she had of being considered too pop, mm. not R&B enough, mm -hmm. you know, getting booed at the Soul Train Awards in 1989. And then actually working with Clive Davis to be more R&B, to shore up her R&B credentials because she understood that R&B, among other things, was a community. And it mm. was a community... Um, that she wanted to be part of. So yes, you see, um, you see both of the, the the inclusion and 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 the and the exclusion, and you see that those things go hand in hand, and that often even in R and B, I don't think it's a coincidence that sometimes the the genres that say like everyone's welcome, it's whoever you know, we accept all styles of music. Sometimes those are the genres that pay the most attention to pop charts. Yeah, right, because right. if everyone's welcome and it can yeah. sound like whatever, well, you need some way of distinguishing like what actually this thing is, yeah. and so that's one thing that charts do really well. And so, if you want to figure out like, am I accepted in country music? You can look at the charts. And, and one thing that surprised me when I first started interviewing country singers is the unembarrassed way that they would talk about metrics of musical success. You know, oh, they really? would talk about chart placements the way a, an athlete might talk about his stats, right? And they'd be like, well, the last album, we thought we had a really good album. We got a slow start. The first single only went up to number 12. Oh, and then wow. we came back with the second single. We were excited to get to number four on that. A lot of people worked really hard, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and it's not like, you know, in you know in indie rock or something, you might be embarrassed to brag about your stats. Maybe that's changing now with sure. streaming. But yeah, yeah the yeah. idea is like, yeah. this is a measure of who's listening. And mm. so that's another way of judging your standing in that community. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I When you were mentioning that Green Day thing, it brought me back to when I was reading uh, that part of the book. And I remembered thinking, I remembered about how, uh, uh, how uh, polarizing they were when I was in grade school and how uh, they were scaring parents and scaring the, the teachers when we would bring that in. And now mm -hmm. to think of them... Um, doing these ads on bus shelters and, you know, one step away from Dancing with the Stars. It's just funny how these things evolve. 
Yeah, and to the gnarly elder statesmen and elder stateswomen of punk, when Green Day came out, they were a joke, right? right. It was like, oh, these kids with their— And yeah. then, like, it didn't take that many years before you had Green Day fans sneering at Blink-182. <laughs> And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, and you know, so you have this this kind of this treadmill, and, and part of the, um, the, you know, part of the lasting appeal of punk is that it can be both things at war at once. That it can be, you know, it can be sort of all embracing and kind of pop, and it can be more kind of purist and monkish, yeah. and that those identities can somehow exist in tension with each other. I'm curious why. Um, oh. I love the book so much, and and oh, thanks. I just wanted to show you that I have a copy. I didn't steal a yeah, PDF you're holding it up. from somewhere. <laughs> a physical I'm, book. I'm curious why. Oh, and by the way, uh, while we're at it, uh, the and and our listeners can't see this, although this is on this has been on our website in our book section for a, a couple of months now. Um, but it reminds me of Hat Show Print from Nashville. The cover, yeah, uh, it's got that uh, you know advertisements from the Ryman kind of vibe, uh, but the pages. This is such a waste of, of your time to be talking about this. Pages are so smooth. I've always I was just turning them and very smooth. <laughs> yeah, pages. I think that's I think that's related to um, uh, that has something to do with the kind of paper they use. There's, there's, there's a, <laughs> the UK version actually is is thicker. Oh, um, interesting. I think so. It has to do with supply chain, and yeah, it's actually um, it's probably actually closer to the Colby Poster Printing Company. They they do a lot of concert flyers oh, okay. in LA. Oh, okay. And, Oh and, yeah, yeah. You know, that they stick on the on the on the el el electric oh. poles. Uh, um, my apologies so yeah, for getting of, the reference wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's a it's a tribute to that whole thing. I, I'm curious why you felt the need to write a book about genres. What was it? This mm -hmm. like last minute obituary for the term. I mean, it seems <laughs> even like a concept. Uh, uh, the concept of genres is is more of a thing uh, of nostalgia for for certainly for me. Yeah, I think. Um, it was, well, it was, I had two, there was two ideas. One was, okay, I want to, I want to tell the story of popular music. How do I do that? And how do I do it in a way that feels like a story, that doesn't feel like an encyclopedia? And, and so one way to mm -hmm, do that was mm -hmm. to kind of shrink oh, it sure. into these seven smaller stories of genres. And, and because so many people working within genres are in dialogue with each other. If you're a country singer, you're sort of thinking about what was happening before you, you're reacting to it, you're rebelling against it. So that would make each chapter feel more like a story. Yeah. Um, but the other part was that I think genres are important. And also I kind of wanted to make the possibly counterintuitive argument that genres are good, actually. I, I think it's I think it's easy and tempting to kind of position oneself mm. against genres, mm -hmm. right? Whether you're a listener or a musician, and genres are like the box, and that's like yeah. hemming us in, man. And like a true musician transcends genre. <laughs> a true listener <laughs> listens to all yeah. sorts of stuff. And certainly I understand yeah. the appeal of that, but but <laughs> thinking of a genre as a community helps you understand not just how genres might be good in the way that communities are good, also how a genre might be annoying in the way a community is annoying, right? It might feel more like a, a homeowner's association than a neighborhood. <laughs> um, and that both of those things are often yeah. in tension, and that explains why at different times it's really meaningful to musicians to be part of a genre, and at other times it's really annoying to musicians to be part of a genre mm. and to listeners, and they say, like, get me out of here. I don't want anything mm. to do with this. But yeah. probably the biggest yeah. surprise as I was researching this book and writing it and going back, you know, the story I tell is basically 50 years. It's basically what happened after the 60s, 1970 to 2020. And mm. going back, one of the things I realized was that there were these moments over and over again when it felt like genres were dissolving, where it felt like this thing, this way of listening to music and selling music mm maybe it didn't work so well anymore. Um, you think about the disco moment where like all of a sudden everyone's making mm. disco records. And it's not just like R&B singers, but it's, you know, Latin jazz yeah. artists. Yeah. And it's European, yeah, and Sesame Street and European yeah. electronic producers Sesame and the Rolling Street. Stones and Star Wars <laughs> and Rod Stewart. Yeah. And like, that's a real coming together moment. And there's yeah. real power in that. And <laughs> at that moment, it probably felt that way, right? Like, oh, Genres mm. are this thing that they used to do back in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. but now here we are in the future. We can all come together on the dance floor to a beat that works, and a DJ can blend all these records together, and it's all one thing. 
And of course, yeah. that sounds funny now because we know what happened next. We know that the result of that was an enormous backlash and yeah. a complicated yeah. backlash, right? It's, it's a lot of people have written about how this was yeah. a backlash against black music, against queer music, um, which is a little bit, I think it's mm-hmm. slightly misleading mm-hmm. just right. because the idea of disco as black music and queer music is something that we we really celebrate today for good reason. But at the time, you know, the, the the faces that were associated with disco was like John Travolta, the Bee Gees, Disco Duck, Rick Dees, right. like a lot the of, Bee Gees, yeah. you know, if yeah. you're someone who's not a musical connoisseur, you don't necessarily know <laughs> that much about Sylvester. Um, and, and so... And so a lot of people right. in the dance That's music world even were like, yeah, this disco thing they're doing at Studio 54, this is not like what we're doing at the warehouse in Chicago. This is not, right? Disco, th- th- there was a critique of disco as being like too mainstream, right. not underground enough. And right. so in all sorts of ways, you get these very genre mm identified genres coming out, right? You get like the rock and roll backlash. Punk is kind of a backlash. In an odd way, right. like new wave and pop, it's not exactly a backlash, but the idea is like, let's set ourselves apart from disco. Let's use more of a backbeat instead of a four on the floor. Let's have kind of mm-hmm. slightly sharper mm-hmm. rhythms. You see that in R&B, embracing synthesizers and backbeats in a way to say like, okay, we've moved on from disco. Um, you see that obviously in house and, te- and techno, which were you know descendants of disco, but also in their own ways, defining themselves against disco. And certainly hip hop comes out of disco, but it also defines itself mm-hmm. against disco. So you get all of these backlashes creating all of these new genres. And so right. certainly that made me wonder you know, are we living through a moment of this like Lil Nas X moment where in streaming music especially, sometimes it feels like everything is the same thing and like Post Malone is every genre at once. And maybe that Mm. just sets the stage for people to be sick of that. Yeah. For people to say, I hate these streaming companies. I hate this idea that like all music Mm. is all music and it's all one thing and it's fine. And we are going to do something a little more insular and a little more with a sharper musical identity somewhere else, because traditionally that's what's happened. Well, at moments when the genres seem like they're dissolving, you're kind of maybe setting the stage for the next era, the next iteration of genres. And again, if you think of a musical genre as a musical community, then it makes a lot of sense to be like, yeah, communities aren't going away. The specific communities we have might go away. The way we define communities yeah, might go that's away. Right. But like, because music has this social aspect to it, even now, you know, we're going to find ways to identify ourselves with certain people mm. and against certain other people. I I want to this. You know, this is the question. I'm very curious that uh, that uh, what came out of your research and and I feel like you know even going back in this book, music as we know it is kind of young. Like a hundred years ago is is when back in the Edison days. So, I mean, it's really a a short period that we're dealing with. I remember when people were talking about mourning the death of the album, whenever MP3s were Mm -hmm. coming out, I thought the album really is pretty young. It's in its 20s or 30s when we we were talking about it being (laughs) dying. This is my question. As you were doing the research for the book, did you get a better sense of what is lasting and 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 what is temporary in the music industry? This is something that a lot of us record labels have to deal mm. with, platforms and formats that are fleeting styles and genres. Did you get a sense of what's lasting and, and what's temporary? Well, th- there's an irony here, right? Which is that I think... Um, I think there's an idea or a cliche that record labels are like always chasing the latest thing because that's how you make money and trying to sell something now. And that music critics are there to pronounce on like what music will stand the test of time. But sometimes now it feels like the opposite. Sometimes now it feels like if you're a label, you know, and and certainly if you're somewhere else in the industry, if you're a manager or something, um, you spend a lot of time thinking about like, well, which artist is really going to build a career? Which artist is, you know, because that's, if you want to make real money, that's who you want to be attached to. And ironically, sometimes it's the critics who might be a little better, who might, because they don't have any skin in the game, Uh, who might be better situated (laughs) to appreciate the value of music that doesn't necessarily last. Mm. Um, You know, I I, I write in the book, I, I, I write about this idea of, this idea of like, well, why... Why do we trust future listeners more than we trust contemporary listeners? 
So if there's some music, some song, something that contemporary listeners love and listeners in the future just don't get it, one way of describing that would be like, oh, well, like the people who were around then were wrong mm. and future generations realized that like that album was actually bad. That singer was actually bad, okay. yeah. right? But you could also think of it the other way and be like, oh, there was something about that and you kind of maybe had to be there yeah. and future generations <laughs> will never understand the way we did. That's That's oh, been a man. big issue for dance music, right? Because traditionally, especially in the early years, but still to some extent, people talk less in terms of albums and sometimes less even in terms of tracks and more in terms of parties. Like this was an incredible mm -hmm. night mm -hmm. and maybe people who weren't there will never get it. You think about a lot of the stuff in the 70s where you know, the, the party wasn't even recorded. And so you have all these stories of these amazing DJs <laughs> and like it's hard to really tell. Like yeah, there's nothing, yeah. there's no archive. Right. Um, and, and so I, I, I suggest somewhat mischievously that, that maybe we think of like one hit wonders and, and songs that kind of go really huge and then fade. Maybe we think of that as like languages that go extinct. Mm -hmm. And and like yeah. there's a moment when the last person who actually liked that song is dead <laughs> and then we can never recover that knowledge. Um, so yes, I, I, I do want to, um, you know, the idea that it's necessary, that what we should be thinking about or what we should be prizing is necessarily what lasts. Uh, you know, I am a little bit skeptical of that. Although obviously, again, for people who are in the industry, you know, that's an important thing to figure out if you're trying to build a business. If you're a yeah. if you're a manager, it's really important to know that you're managing someone who's gonna be even huger in 20 years. That's right. Even as even as I would counsel anyone who's like writing about music to not necessarily try and make those predictions. Mm -hmm. I've always thought that if if you're a music critic or writer and you're really good at predicting like who the big star is gonna be, um, you're probably in the wrong line of work. You could probably yeah. make a lot more money yeah. um, monetizing, <laughs> monetizing that instinct. <laughs> well, I, um, but but I will say like sure. one of the things that I love about music is that it's so it's so often so hard to predict, right? You're right. Often right. things that feel like a fad. Yeah end up sticking around, right? Like think about <laughs> auto-tune. That's like, a good if point. Someone had yes, told that's you, right, yeah. You know, when Believe yeah. by Cher comes out in right. whenever it was, 1998, Yeah. right? You would have been like, oh, I don't know if this is going to be a thing, right? Yeah. Like, and, and um, you know, Jay-Z does DOA, Death of Auto-Tune. Right, right. Yeah. And you might be like, okay, maybe this is over. T-Pain comes out and you're like, yeah. okay, this is not going <laughs> to. Yeah. And like auto-tune turned out to be just like a whole new constellation of yeah. musical tools. Yeah. And to say that auto-tune was dead is kind of like saying like the electric guitar is dead right. or something. Yeah. Like that point. people are gonna some suddenly decide to stop that's using digital point. processing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so um that's one of the things that makes it um makes it exciting. I remember I remember going on um I remember going on some shows, like maybe it was like a, a public radio concert or something. Uh, I mean, public radio broadcast. It was like the morning after the Grammys. And uh, I think like it was after Nora Jones won all her Grammys. Mm -hmm. And I remember there being a discussion that sort of took it for granted that like Nora Jones was like an artist that would stand the test of time. Yeah. And yeah. like Nelly, who was who had hot in hair at that time, I right. think, was kind of like a flash in the pan. And I was right. kind of like, well, no, like, one of the things about music is it's never obvious. It's never obvious mm -hmm. who, you know, you can yeah. make an argument, you can be right and you can be wrong empirically, although even that is not settled, right? Yeah. What we think about Nelly and Nora Jones now might be different again in, that's, in 20 that's years. That's right, yeah. That's a good point. So there was this comment, is some someone in the press a few months ago um said something about how old music is better than new music uh, on, mm -hmm. on a whole. I can't, it might've been like a rock star or somebody who said it. I can't mm -hmm. remember. Of course there was an uproar, but I'm curious if it's true. I mean, I, I know this is an impossible gotcha question here, but I mean like something like 80% of streams on Spotify are catalog releases. Yeah. Was there a, a, like an unrepeatable golden era? Well, it's a couple things. There is some interesting data, right? That suggests that, the percentage, the 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 market share of catalog mm -hmm. on streaming services is actually increasing over time, mm. um, which you know is interesting for someone like me who novelty is one of the things I love about music. It's a, yeah. a little scary. Yeah. Um, you know that said, it does seem I'd be interested to look at radio data and to look at you know the rise of formats like oldies and mm. then starting I think in the early '80s classic rock. And and the share of of terrestrial radio that has been catalog versus new music. I mean, one of the interesting things about streaming is that 
in the old days, we didn't have a great way to monitor which old records people were listening to. Right. We could monitor it indirectly yeah. by yeah. like, oh, well, who sells concerts? I mean, yeah. concert tickets, who sells T-shirts? What do the oldie stations play? But like, once someone bought the record, listening to that record was private, right? You'd and have now to ask a record store clerk, somebody selling used used records. <laughs> Yes, and, and you could get a sense from, but yeah. even that is pretty because people weren't necessarily replacing their stuff <laughs> yeah. that often. Yeah. But you saw a boom in catalog in the CD era, right? When mm -hmm. the when the industry was making a lot of money with people replacing their vinyl yeah. with CDs. Um, so but yeah, yeah that's I, true. I think it's a good point. I, I'd be interested in what the data looks like. That that isn't you know the, that is one of the interesting things about streaming, right? Is is if an if a if playing an old song is as easy to monetize as playing a new song. You know, do, do labels have less incentive to break new songs, and, right. and they might as well like devote more time to trying to more fully exploit older songs? And certainly, you see that now in the the, the arms race in the copyright world, right? Mm -hmm. Where Hypnosis yeah. and all these other yeah. firms are paying crazy amounts of yeah. money for old songs, and the idea is like, oh, there's a lot of juice left in these songs, and yeah. we're just gonna like give them a better squeeze. Um, yeah. Uh, so yes, so I, I think I think there is a sense of that. I think I think one thing that happens, my suspicion is that one thing that happens is that this happens within genres. I think as genres get old, older, time sometimes does seem to slow down, right? Mm. So so if you look at rock and roll, you know, the the Nirvana, their breakthrough is thirty years ago, right? Mm. If which is as old now as the Beatles' breakthrough was when Nirvana came out. Um, but it doesn't feel right. like that, yeah. right? It doesn't. Right. It feels like we're yeah. sort of just living still in that post-Nirvana moment, partly yeah. because the grunge template ha was so long-lasting, right? And right. that 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 way yeah. of making music sort of never met, went away. Yeah. If you talk about like mainstream rock today, which yeah. ironically are these bands that aren't very culturally mainstream, right? But like the bands that get played on on like active rock radio or something. Right. You can. It's still like a post-Nirvana thing that's happening. So I think within genres, you've started to see hip hop start to slow down a little bit. Mm. Um, Jay Z, for instance, feels like he's still present in the hip hop world. Right. You know, he's not necessarily making hits day to day, but he's still a, an important figure in hip hop, even though his debut was more than twenty five years ago. Yeah. And yeah. you know, and, yeah. and it's similar. You know, if you go twenty five years before Jay Z's debut. You're in like 1971. Yes, and yeah. like, and you know, Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder weren't present in that same way well, then. So I think the genres slow down. So I think within some newer genres, I think I think that's less true. In other words, like, so it, it may be that you see the rise of hip hop oldies and people listening to catalog hip hop, mm. but in something else in reggaeton or Latin trap or something, which I would say is in a golden age now. It seems to be moving really fast, right. and what Bad Bunny or Alejandro Rao are doing right now feels very different from what Daddy Yankee and Wisin Yandel were doing in the two thousands. I see. Yeah, I mean, it's it's very interesting, and I think it really is just it's it's probably rooted in nostalgia. But I, I always I often wonder if if we're going to have another, you know, what we what we call classic albums today. Um, mm -hmm. you know, do we have classic albums from the last 10 years or even the last 20 years? Uh, will they be calling anything that we're listening to today classic albums? I, I, I mean, that's a it's, a, it's a crazy question, but sometimes you wonder. Yeah, I mean, and I think, um, yes, I, I think I think that term, that term will endure. And as long as people are thinking about music in that way, there will be some of that. Now, I, I've got to say, you know, often when we talk about a classic album, sometimes it's because the album is amazing. Sometimes it has to do with mythology mm -hmm. and yeah. a big legend, yeah. right? Yeah. Like so, and, and that plays an important role in the way people talk about. You know, if it's Jeff Buckley or Amy Winehouse, right. a lot of the albums that have have accrued that sort of gravitas, it's because it's linked to a particular story, right? And yeah. I think that that's true. Um, and and you know, obviously, it takes a little while. To shake out, but like it wouldn't be at all surprising to me if a generation 10, 20, 30 years ago looked back at this era and be like, wow, you were alive during the Bad Bunny era. Yeah. Like those <laughs> yeah. records are important. Yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. records inspired yeah. all these subgenres. That's um, right. Again, it's not, it's, it, you know, sometimes it's not exactly where you're looking. And, and, you know, I think if you'd, if you'd stopped someone on the street, certainly the day like 
AT Aliens came out in, in 1996 by Outkast and been like, well, here's a classic album that will stand sure. with the greats. Yeah. Like that might have seemed like a strange thing to say. Now I'm not sure that would be that um, controversial. I was surprised going through the book how often race played a role in the genres mm -hmm. of your book. And, yeah. and 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 I'm you know as a Canadian a white Canadian I'm fairly ignorant to some of the the sonic segregation that had taken place where where artists or songs could or couldn't be included in a genre or or even played on a radio station how has race played a role in defining the genres that we know today Yeah I mean it's played a huge role I mean one irony is that you know, obviously there's all sorts of historical reasons for the continuing segregation of American society, and that segregation is echoed and sometimes underscored um, in the music. Um, but that said, one of the strange things I've realized is that often American music is consumed in other places um, where the musical charts are less segregated, hmm. but part of the reason maybe they're less segregated is because sometimes there are fewer black people. In other words, like in America, with 12 or 13% of the population black, like that's big enough to be like a real music marketplace. Sure. And yeah. in some of the places where American music is, is consumed, there isn't, a, uh, there isn't a, as big a population with, that's black or with mm -hmm. roots in Africa mm -hmm. that you could actually market to them. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly, um, so certainly in the U.S., the, the music has, has very much reflected the segregation of society and at various points, the musicians themselves have had mixed feelings about that. There's mm. this moment in the early 80s where Billboard renames its soul music chart, as it was then known, renames it black music. <laughs> and, you know, in some ways, this was a move to be more inclusive, right? The right. term black music might include jazz and gospel and hip hop mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but of course, it also underscores the segregation, and so some mus some musicians were like, "Well, wait a second, why why are we over here in the like? You don't have a white music category, yeah, like right. what are you doing?" Um, and, and you know, I, I think about there was an idea that when stuff gets all mixed up, as you see during, for example, the disco era, sometimes that means that you know you're you're selling to the mass audience in America, where black people are a small minority. And sometimes that means that black artists, you know, have a hard time competing against white artists, right? Mm -hmm. If there is a if there is a tendency for people to listen to music by people in the same racial category as themselves, not all the time, but sometimes, mm -hmm. then that's going to mean that when you're marketing to America as a whole, the the black audience is just you know again 12, 13 percent of that. So one of the one of the upsides for black artists is being categorized as making black music and being marketed to black listeners is you can be firmly in the mainstream, right? Mm. If you can if you're Luther Vandross, you can be like one of the big names in the history of R&B. I think it was a 2002 Ebony magazine poll, which is a black magazine, the readers voted him like their favorite male singer ever, mm. right? So right. for him, right. R&B was this world where he could be yeah. absolutely at the center, even as Luther Vandross never had a number one pop hit. Mm. Um and and he he once said he was ravenous for a number one pop hit. <laughs> so for him, it was it was really bittersweet, right? On the one hand, like, here's this place that can be yours, that can be your home. Yeah. And on the flip side, it's like, but maybe you'll be stuck there a little bit. Right. And and that feeling of being stuck is 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 tricky. There, there's a further complication, of course, which is that in, in the US, in if you have a genre like R and B that is disproportionately full of black musicians and black listeners. That means just like mathematically that other genres will be disproportionately white. <laughs> right. And so yeah. the question of what that means, you know, obviously country music is the, is the genre that has confronted that most squarely. You know, there are plenty of black musicians in the history and in the present of country music, but the music came to be perceived as white music. Mm -hmm. And... The question of like what that means, it's actually a pretty complicated question because I think a lot of people have an intuition that it would be good for country music to be more diverse, okay. more representative of America yeah. at large, right? Right. Um, but a lot of people wouldn't necessarily have that same intuition about R&B. <laughs> right. But it's not yeah. necessarily yeah. important yeah. that R&B should be more diverse yeah. or more representative. Like it's great that R&B is black music. But I think those things are linked, not just like 
because they should be linked, but just like mathematically, if a, if a, a large number of black musicians and listeners are in one genre, there's going to be less, less of them in other genres. Well, I'm curious because it was interesting to learn that sometimes it became a source of pride. You said in the book, wherever black listeners are disproportionately listening to music made by black musicians, that music will be in a meaningful sense black music, no matter what it sounds like. Is yeah. the role of race in some types of music, is that something we should be working to remove? Like you're talking about with making country more diverse, or is it a source of pride that should be preserved? Well, you know, I try, um, I mentioned briefly in the books, I've, I've, I've played a little bit of music in my life. I played, uh, like I, I took violin lessons my whole life. I played in a succession of very bad bands that yeah. combined <laughs> attracted not a single fan. Um, <laughs> But we have a clip here. Roll the clip. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> l- luckily, I, I am I am entirely confident that you do not have a clip. Um, you know. So, but as as a writer, I've always been careful to not write as an artist, mm. and and which is to say, to not be giving advice to musicians. Yeah, right. Like right. I'm writing in the New York Times, and I you know I would never say like, oh well, this chorus should have done this, and you should have you, you know should, the yeah. guitar should. That's nice. Um, it's just it's, it's more about. <laughs> listening to something and and how do I feel about it? How do I react to it? Is it, you know, does it does it bring me joy or yeah. not? And, you know, that might seem pretty, um, that might seem pretty straightforward and obvious, but I would take that a step further and say that I try not to give advice to genres either. Mm. I try not to give it to say like, oh, yeah. hip hop would be better if it were more like this. Mm. Country music really needs to do that. Um, yeah. And you know, a, a lot That's of people do point. do that and they're comfortable doing that. They can do great writing doing that. But I've just never felt like that was my role, partly because often I'm just surprised by how these genres end up evolving. Mm. And it's often things that are delightful and weird and frustrating and that I could never have predicted. So I tend not to say that a genre should develop in this way or that way. Right. One of the things I generally want genres to continue to do is to reflect the way we live. Mm. And so to the extent that race remains really salient in in, in our lives, especially in the U.S., um, I'm always going to be on the lookout for music that reflects that. Well, that's, I mean, that's so interesting. Uh, and and I, I want to, um, I mean, yeah, that is very interesting. And I think that as you're, as you're saying that, I'm thinking back to the book and it is, you know, 90% uh, an observation of history and, and 10% memoir. I, I didn't really get a <laughs> sense of any sort of critique or, or this needs to happen. Uh, and that's what I loved about it. I, I, I want to ask you a little bit about demographics because I, I don't know if you've read the book um, by uh, Stephen Levy the, about Facebook. There was this part um, yeah. it, about the origins of Cambridge Analytica scandal where that guy had created this like pretty straightforward algorithm. Uh, I think it was like without you know, sinister intent originally um, where you could predict a lot about a person just by looking what they liked on Facebook. And I feel right. like this that's is always the dream, right? That's right. I feel like it's kind of true about music too. Like if you told me someone's top three favorite artists, I could probably tell you whether they shopped at Whole Foods or Bass Pro Shop. And I'm, I'm <laughs> curious, like if you learned anything about demographics or the typical fan of a certain genre. Well, I mean, you know, as a, as a, as someone who doesn't work in the industry, I always wish that we had better data uh, right. Yeah, there, there's there's a frustrating sense in which sometimes it feels like somehow our data has gotten worse as we've moved from like prehistoric <laughs> terrestrial radio broadcast right. technology to Spotify. Um, there's this thing that like for anyone like me who's obsessed with genres and charts, there's this thing that happened where like in the old days, um, you know, the way to measure whether something was a country song was to see if these specific radio stations were playing it. Okay. In the very old days, you could also look and see if these specific record stores were selling it. Right. And that would tell you like, oh, this song is resonating with those people or it's not. Yeah. And like, we're kind of like moving to a thing where like, you know, there's just one chart Mm. and then someone at the chart company goes through and says, well, this song is at number four and it sounds kind of country. Yeah. So that's the number one country song, yeah. right? And so we're not, yeah. so it, it, we don't have, at least, um, you know, people behind the scenes do, but a lot of us listeners don't have great data always about exactly who is listening to what. Yeah. Um, and that, that's true historically too. I mean, I think one of the, um, you know, if you look at the history of rock and roll, I think it would be fascinating to have better data about sex. 
mm-hmm. and about like whether certain tracks were more were listened to or certain bands or certain shows if there were more men or women there that mm-hmm. would give you i think that's been a really neglected part of the way we think about um men and women and rock music for example it's very easy to analyze well like is the performer male or female or it's easy to analyze yeah. like well how are they speaking about gender in their lyrics but um you yeah. know there's that missing piece of like well who actually loves this stuff and so you know we have That's some of that point. indirectly and i mentioned a little of that indirectly right one of the interesting things about hair metal in the 80s is that it was on the one hand perceived as macho mm-hmm. and on the other hand perceived as music that was particularly aimed at and embraced by women that was one difference that some of the bands talked about that yeah. like you know go to a black sabbath show in the 70s versus a motley crew show in the 80s and one difference is that there's many more women in the stands at right. the Motley Crue show. Um, yeah. And so I think that data is just is fascinating. Mm. And I, I wish we had more of it. And wh- that's one of the interesting things about music is the way it gives you a sense, sometimes indirectly, of, of who's listening to it and why. You know, one of the tricky things is that people tend not to be very reliable uh, witnesses on this front, right? <laughs> yes. You ask someone why they like something and they're like, well, it's because he really puts his heart into it yeah. and he seems like a <laughs> yeah. good guy. And I'm like, I don't think that's really what it is. Yeah. Like, I think once you love music, it's easy to to bring in those kinds of associations. But obviously, like, there are plenty of nice musicians and niceness is not the overriding factor here. Yeah. Um. So, <laughs> yeah, so sometimes it feels like you can only look indirectly to figure out who likes what, but again, because of the ways in which our lives are organized, you can kind of notice even now, like, oh, this is resonating over here. Like, here's where they're doing their tour dates. Here's here's sure. the artist that yeah. like sells really well on the coasts of America yeah. and less well in the middle of the country, or vice versa. You're kind of an example of of, of an uh, of a music fan with eclectic taste and and mm-hmm. someone that would be hard to to predict. I mean, you talk about. Uh, your awakening with punk music and your obsession with punk. And then you talk about how you, uh, I think it was your first dance was to a country song and you, at your wedding and, and you mm-hmm. have a, yeah. a, 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 you know, an interest in country music. I mean, there's just little moments that uh, a lot of things were pretty incongruent when I was li- listening to your, <laughs> or reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are different, you know, there are writers who are really good at like, uh, you know, at, at having, one thing that you kind of sink into and you like music mm. that sort of sounds like that. Yeah. And that, that yeah. can be fun for readers to figure out like, oh, there's a through line between this. And like, yeah. you know, here's someone who loves loves Nick Cave and also loves like Angel Olsen. And like, here's yeah. how those things yeah. actually connect, right? Um, um, I've always been, yes, a little bit the opposite. I've always been like kind of greedy, Right. Um, or not always, <laughs> actually. That's uh, Sorry, let me, let me go back. I have not always been, you know, there have been times in my life you know, especially in punk, where like that was all I wanted to hear. Right. And I only wanted to listen to punk music. All my friends like punk music. We go to shows, they'd be punk bands, I play punk on the radio. Like it was like super all consuming. And, you know, I ended up, there's something very perverse about punk, right? About mm-hmm. the idea of, um, the idea of on the one hand that it's going to be like chaotic and no rules and different and rebellious. But at the same time, the birth of punk as it gets nurtured in the 70s, is kind of this movement to purify rock and roll, Mm. is this idea that there was this essence of rock and roll um, in the 60s, and then somehow it had gotten lost, and Mm. we're going to strip that down, and we're going to rediscover that, right? Like, that's the manifesto that Lenny Kay writes on the back of Nuggets, which is a compilation of 60s rock that was one of the first to popularize the term punk. Um, And so those things, so that's a very... In a certain way, that's like aesthetically very reactionary, right? Mm. Like, oh, there's too much extra stuff in rock. We got to make it like it used to be. And that's a very traditional identity. And so the traditionalist identity of punk, where like the Ramones are singing like, do you remember rock and roll radio, is at odds with the identity of punk that is like, oh, this is about rebellion and going crazy and chaos and noise. And so that was really interesting to me. That was something like I spent a lot of time thinking about as a, as a punk listener. And eventually I started to ask myself like, oh, well, if punk really means um, means rebelling in a kind of chaotic way against the strictures of music, 
then probably punk isn't the punkest form of music, mm. right? Probably there are other things that do this even better. And that kind of led me toward, you know, being obsessed with like jungle and drum and bass, right? right I was like, this right. stuff is crazy and futuristic <laughs> and Well, what's your through line? In the 90s? What's your common denominator for the music that you well, enjoy? Well, so, so, um, so, so that led me like, it kind of, that led me also to like loving hip hop and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But, but beyond a certain point, I started to question those premises, right? Like who says like, okay, you could argue that hip hop is more rebellious and audacious and defiant and creative than punk, right? Mm -hmm. Probably right. But then like, who says that those are the only ways that music can be good? Like music is supposed to be rebellious, like says who, right? right? right. And so, um, you know, that, you know, that led me into being able to enjoy and really love, you know, mainstream pop and country music and all sorts of other stuff. And so, I, tr I and it led me to be skeptical in general of the sort of values that people sneak into their musical judgments because it led me to think about how every genre tends to have its own values and its own system and its own its own values that it prioritizes, right? So when I went from listening mainly to punk to getting back into hip hop, which I'd, I'd loved as a, as a boy, um, my first instinct was to try and find all the punkest hip hop stuff, yeah. right? Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. listening to like Company Flow and all sure. this kind of underground stuff that was happening in the 90s because it was noisy, it was an anti major mm -hmm, label. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered pretty quickly was that like hip hop didn't work the same as punk. Like a lot of the stuff that ended up being way more exciting to me like Wu-Tang Clan, right? right? Who's on a major label. Yeah. They were on multiple major labels at once because they were trying to take over the world. And like, that was part of the excitement. Or like Notorious B.I.G., like making super kind of mainstream hip hop mm -hmm. music and wanting to tell the world his story. And it's not like, oh, those Biggie records would be better if they were like noisier or mm -hmm. more underground. Like, they're great. They're perfect. And so hearing that, Hearing that that helped me understand that different genres had their own value systems and that maybe to truly appreciate them, you needed to figure out a way to at least entertain that other value system. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just bring your own preconceptions to it. And mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, that can be hard to do. That's not something I'm always successful in doing necessarily. But to me, that's the goal is that kind of musical greediness is to be able to hear something and be like, okay, what what life experience would I have to have? What would I have to know to really understand this? And, yeah. and one way to do that is try and figure out like, well, what are other people getting from this? Mm. And it doesn't end up meaning that I like everything, but it does end up meaning that I like a lot of things. Yeah. I, I, I think, I, th that said, I do have my own prejudices like anyone else. Um, I love novelty. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for stuff that seems somehow new in some way. Yeah. Um, I have a hard time sometimes with music that is very retro, yeah. especially if yeah. the people are wearing like old fashioned clothes yeah. and goofy <laughs> yeah, hats. Yeah. Um, that's hard for me. Yeah, um, same. Sometimes I think that that reflects something that you mentioned earlier, which is this idea that maybe music used to be more original mm. and that we're living through a very like nostalgic moment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Although of course, even that is like kind of ironic because that would mean that that prejudice reflects my own nostalgia <laughs> for an earlier time when people were less nostalgic. Right. Um, so it's, <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, maybe there's no avoiding nostalgia in that sense. But I guess, I guess, I guess the, the, the broader way to say that is, you know, maybe there's no avoiding prejudice. Like you have your own prejudices always, right? Your right. preconceptions, right. a preconception is just a different, uh, another way of talking about an idea. And the only way we're able to make sense of music is that we bring our own ideas to it. And part of the fun is that sometimes in the process, you can your your ideas can be challenged. I want to ask you a little bit about pop music. Financially, the the pinnacle of success for any artist or or genre is to have your song or your style reach the mainstream and and be considered yeah. pop music. It seems like maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like. Pop music is when you transcend your original genre, like Taylor Swift or Kanye or or even Nora Jones. You know what we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, and and Buble too at, at that time. Um, and I think you mentioned in the book too about that was explicitly the goal of Motown was to to graduate yeah. from R and B. So what to be is the sound of Young America? What is the yeah. yes? That's right. What is the what is pop music? Um, and 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 just is it just everyone who's risen to the top of their genre? Well, it's funny. It shows the power of genres because pop music starts out as an anti-genre, 
or a catch-all or a meta genre mm. or something. And like, you know, in the 60s, pop was everything, right? Like Beatles were pop. In fact, like, um, you know, they they were called pop stars because the, the word rock star wasn't really, as far as I can tell, widely used until the 70s. Mm. Um, so a lot of those, the, what we think of as those 60s rock stars right. were thought of as it's popular pop music. Stars, yeah. They're, yeah, they're pop stars. Um, in the 70s, more and more, you see pop starting being started to use um, as a pejorative term. You're pop, you you go pop, and you're pop, as you just said, because you've left your genre behind. Can I interrupt and, you for a second? Mm-hmm. Was it the, the, with the term pop? Where did that come from? Was that like a, a, a like like a? Did you mention that in the book that it was like some sort of like uh, vapor, like some sort of bubble? Was that? Or am I making that I don't that know up? that connection. <laughs> no, I mean I think it's it comes from popular music. If you look at something like the Boston, oh popular. Pops, Okay. There is this yes. idea of like the Boston Pops as an orchestra that plays lighter fare. And that's why they're the Pops. So sometimes even orchestras were considered to be pop in that sense. And, right. Um, okay. Sorry. And, and of course, starting in the, um, you know, you also have that coterminously with pop art. And mm-hmm. so there is this idea that, you know, the, I don't know if it's actually linked to like the idea of a bubble popping, but the idea that it is yeah. kind of fizzy in a way right. is there okay. in, in the 1960s. It, it, in the 70s, you know, it starts to be used a little bit pejoratively. Right. And again, if yeah. you think of a genre as a community, then it makes sense. It's like, well, you've turned your back on your community, uh, right? You've gone pop. Yes. You're not yeah. really country anymore. Yeah. You're not really a, you're not, you're not a rock band. You're yeah. the Carpenters. You're quote unquote, just pop. Um, and then in the 80s, um, especially in the UK with Boy George and a bunch of people like that, a bunch of people start to reclaim that. That's one of the first times you see people really flying the flag of pop. <laughs> right. It's not just the bin you get thrown into. Yes. It's like, no, this is what we're doing. We're making pop music. We're waving the flag. And pop has its own values, right? Pop is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be fashionable. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be catchy. It's supposed to be kind of anti-idealistic. It's about like money. It's about novelty. Um, you know, one of many ironies is that a lot of those groups that were waving the flag of pop music, like ABC, right? The kind of British new romantic or new pop groups, a lot of them weren't all that popular, mm. right? <laughs> like, right. you know, ACDC back then was like more popular than most of those quote unquote pop groups. Interesting. Um, but, the, but there is a sound that really congeals in the 80s. I think even now, you know, I, I, people sometimes ask me my favorite pop record, um, uh, and I will say Borderline by Madonna. Okay. And even now, there is a sense in which when people say pop, when they're talking about Robin yeah. or Katy Perry or whatever, it sounds, or even if they're talking about Charlie XCX, yeah. it sounds a little bit like Madonna, like that yeah. 80s Madonna in terms of the synthesizers gated and the drum snare. programming and everything. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Gated yeah. Snare, like on the Cyndi Lauper record. Yeah. Um, and so- uh, That's you know, true. So it kind of almost, despite itself, it became a genre, <laughs> and so and, and now you have this funny situation where not only do people fly the flag for pop, but you have you know Robin is a great example. You have like sort of like kind of cult underground pop, mm. right? Like Robin's popular, but she's not like huge. Yeah, I mean she's not, and 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 in fact you have like hyper pop. And you have, you know, PC, whether it's PC music or um, or some of the American stuff, people kind of taking pop and pushing it. So it's taking the sounds of pop and creating something really strange with it. Yes. And so, you know, sometimes now it seems like pop as a genre, sometimes it seems like it's not actually all that popular. Mm, right? Yeah. Like That's a great point. Like, yeah. Travis Scott is huge. Like his yeah. music doesn't necessarily sound pop the way Robin does. Right, right. Um, and so, so yes, pop as a genre is a thing that like, in fact, if someone says that their favorite kind of music is pop music, they're probably a connoisseur. Yeah, you think right? so? Like, uh, yeah, I think that's a term that's used as by connoisseurs to kind of like give each other the nod. Wow. I'm not sure that it's used... Your average person that's listening to like today's top hits yeah. on Spotify, yeah, I don't know that that person thinks of her or himself as a pop fan. Oh, that's funny. I would have said the complete opposite. I would have, if somebody t- tells me they're a fan of pop, I would just assume they're a passive listener. No, I don't think that's how like Adele fans are describing <laughs> yeah, themselves. Good, I mean, I don't know. We'll have to get them on here. We'll have to come. <laughs> but but it just might mean that you need a different term yeah, or you yeah, need no, a. No, it's you know, true. I, I sometimes wonder if, like, the streaming services themselves, like, if this is partly a business story, you know, do people, I, you know, it's maybe waned a little mm. bit now, but I sometimes think about, like, Spotify pop as a genre. And, and right, like, right. that, like, kind of, like, Post Maloney, Lil Nas X-y, right. Lord Billie Eilish thing. Yeah, and, interesting. Like, 
Yeah. And it, it makes me wonder if then you'll see like the, you know, a rebellion against that and, and a rebellion against the streaming services themselves, right? Like I'm not putting my music on there. Yes. I'm going to keep it here. Well, this is a segue to my next question. The most interesting part of the genre story for me, even before I picked up your book, is how Spotify have started to view music as a mood or a lifestyle companion that's categorized mm -hmm. by activity or mood. Like yeah. I said, as much as I don't like Spotify dictating anything for me, I do kind of gravitate to this type of classification more like summer music or, or dinner party music. What are your thoughts on genre definitions based on how the music makes us feel as opposed to how the music was made maybe? Well, I think uh, a couple things. One is one of the things I love about music is that it's, popular music especially, is that it's kind of made to accompany your life. Mm -hmm. You don't have to stop your life the way you do to watch a movie. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You can do it while you're doing something else. Yeah. And like, you know, the uh, the ultimate example of that, of course, is dance music, which, you know, as a term, you know, throughout most of human history probably sounded redundant, right? right. Like music and dancing yeah, went that's together. True. Good point. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, the idea of music being meant to accompany something is you know, is great and mm -hmm. is not new. The way the way that Spotify classifies it is interesting because I think there is this idea, there is this, there, there is this idea that like, oh, maybe it's not so much a community, it's an activity. Mm. And when we're going on a walk, we put on this kind of music. And when we're at home doing something else, we put on that kind of music. You know, and, and I think for, for some people it does function that way, but I also think that you can't wriggle out of the communal identity of music that easily. Mm. You know, it's not, um, it, it's not long before people start to feel like that's really basic. Mm. Like, I don't want to listen to the same walking around music as everyone else. I don't want to listen to the same cleaning my apartment music <laughs> as everyone else, right? Like, so I think, I think built into that, there is this, you know, this snobbery in the most basic sense that is, is lives inside all of us of, of yeah. wanting to be a little different, wanting to have our own identity. And I think you're going to, I think, I think over time, I think that can't help but reassert itself somehow. Mm. And, and, and Spotify is interesting because it does both, right? It makes, it makes discovery so easy. It also, um, you know, in that sense, it enables the rise of these, you know, you might think of them as micro genres, like these fandoms mm -hmm. where yeah. people online are super devoted to just one artist and yeah. they just stand that artist yeah. really hard. Yeah. And you can like spend your whole day like screaming at people on social media about your favorite <laughs> artist, which is a form of like fan activity that didn't exist when I was growing up, right? Mm -hmm. Like you send true. away and maybe you get your little fan club membership <laughs> later, but like, you know, screaming at people about your favorite music was not really a way to spend a few hours. And yeah. now it is. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's an interesting example of how these online platforms enable both more passive consumption of like just browsing and more like hyperactive consumption yeah. of joining these like micro genres, these micro tribes and really going to war. What's next in the story arc of these genres that you wrote about? Uh, where do you think we are in, in some of their, uh, their storylines? Well, it's, it's an interesting moment in the U.S. because, you know, the conventional wisdom that these genre lines are dissolving a little bit goes hand in hand with this political story that, that we're often told, which is that political lines are hardening mm. and that like America is separating into two tribes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes those things overlap, but, you know, I saw a few weeks ago, I went to see Morgan Wallen at Madison Square Garden, the country singer who was uh, for a few months kicked off of country radio after he was caught on tape using the N word. And partly because of that, and partly just because of his vibe, He's kind of emerged as a really polarizing figure, even mm -hmm. though he doesn't really talk about politics. So, you know, between songs, people were chanting USA or like, <laughs> right. let's go, Brandon. Right. You know, the anti Biden right, right. chant. And so that felt very tribal, even though his musical identity is like kind of fuzzy. He's borrowing from hip hop, he's yeah. bringing in a lot of rock and roll from pop in his country music. So that's an idea of how these musical tribes can sometimes fit on top of our political tribes. Mm. But honestly, I think our political tribes are just too big to really be effective at giving people the kind of meaning and identity that they've typically wanted from music. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's enough for people to say, like, I'm like this half of the country and I'm not like that half of the country. Yeah. Like, I don't think that's specific enough. So I think, you know, I, I think one way or another, 
you're going to end up seeing some new form of fragmentation. And again, because we are social and equally antisocial animals, um, you know, that'll be a kind of a social fragmentation. And I think maybe I wouldn't be surprised. Again, I'm not a uh, I'm not I'm not smart enough or well paid enough to be like a trend forecaster, but I do think maybe we are living in this moment of dissolution um, that is going to be followed by by a new you know by a new moment of 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 some of these boundaries reasserting themselves. Mm. I think um, you know I, th- I think one thing that's interesting is that you know it used to take a long time and a lot of money to really become proficient in a genre to join the thing like i remember trying to like trying to decode house and techno music in the late 90s and it was so hard it was like there'd be like an article in spin magazine you know like mike rubin wrote a couple of things in spin magazine and i'd like okay but like a lot of the dance music magazines weren't that nerdy about music and you try to figure out like which albums to buy, but it wasn't really about albums. In those days, it was kind of hard to get your hands on DJ mixes. I would go to like techno record stores where you could, where they had turntables and I would like listen to a bunch of techno 12 inches and then I'd like buy a couple and then take them home and feel like I hadn't made that much progress. Whereas now it's much easier. And so it is possible to me on the one hand that maybe you'll see people that maybe these 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 genre communities maybe they're more short lived. Maybe it's easier for people to move in and out of genres mm. because it's so much easier to do the research and there's not the kind of commitment. That said, if you look at the world of social media now, I don't think you'd say that like oh people are ch- switching their identities all the time and like they're holding them loosely. No, in the social media world. People hold really tightly to their identities, right? Often political identities or or their social identities. And so again, maybe that is another, maybe that is a sign that like you're gonna see, you'll see that in music too. You'll see that that human urge to find something, to find a group, find a tribe, and really hold on to it. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if in some different way music continued to play a part in that process. Uh, this I, I fantasize thinking about the research process. I, I imagine this must have been a, a joy and 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 also a, a huge pain in the ass. For uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that that's been true ever since I was ever since people started to 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 pay me to write about music. It's been this job that's super fun, and even when it's not fun, um, you can't really complain about it because no one wants to hear. You're whining about having to go to <laughs> five to... concerts in a week, right? Like it doesn't sound that bad. Um, and so this, you know, you know, obviously part of it was that I'd been thinking about this stuff for years. Mm. Um, I've been writing about music since since the '90s, and then part of it was just being able to go back and like listen to a lot of albums I'd meant to listen to, read a lot of books I'd meant to read. Um, one of the fun things was reading old periodicals okay. and just seeing the kinds of judgments that people were making in newspapers and magazines at yes. the time. I'm really, yes. I'm really skeptical of the way in which we kind of revise our musical judgments over the years yes. and arrive at certain at, arrive at certain views, and so that we're yep. all kind of like in. You know, we're all in tune with other stuff and we're all on the same page. And obviously everyone knows this is good and this is bad. And seeing how that stuff often really wasn't obvious at the time. Well, does um, it make you really pause as a as a journalist to, to say, I'm going to hold off? And you said, I think you said originally you, you don't critique as much, but to, to hold off saying, you get a sense that what you're hearing might be a fad but I'm going to hold off and critiquing it just in case in 50 years somebody writes a book and quotes me. <laughs> well, well, no, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. That's the fun and the, and the scary part of when I was hired in 2002 to be like a music critic in the New York Times, right? Like, that's terrifying. Yeah. You're going to like, yes. you're going to have this fire hose of music <laughs> blasted at your face and then you've got to take to the pages of like the New York goddamn Times <laughs> and like render judgment. Yeah. And you knew... That you know, when you get it wrong, or when you when you get it wrong, people will go back and be like, "What were you thinking?" Yeah. Um. I I, I do think that you know, for I think for there is a tension when you're a critic between, on the one hand, you don't want to agree with conventional wisdom all the time. Sure. Because then you just be boring and you just mm. be regurgitating conventional. You want to reserve your right to say like, "Yeah, everyone loves this thing. I think it's bad." 
Um, and you want to reserve your right to make judgments not only that your contemporaries will disagree with, but that future readers will disagree with, right? Yeah. It's not just a case of like, I'm trying to guess what people will like in 20 years. Like, yeah. I'm trying to tell you what resonates with me. And if I'm being honest, that's a little different than what resonates right. with everyone else. Um, that said, if your judgments are too wild and too different from conventional wisdom, then you'll just seem like a crank and your work won't be that useful to people. Because it'll be like, oh, there goes that crazy guy saying crazy stuff about music that doesn't relate to my taste. I think you meant... So, Sorry, finish your thought. Sorry. <laughs> no, no. So, so I think I think that there is a kind of a there is a kind of a push and a pull. I think there's a I think that there's a um, I think a, uh, these days there's a tendency to talk about like bad takes, right? Like, mm -hmm. oh, that was mm -hmm. a bad take. Yeah. But like that could mean a few things. It could mean that you, that's something that people disagree with now. It could mean that that's a, an opinion that people disagree with later. And in in both cases, I would I would reserve. The, I think it's important for critics to sometimes be disagreeable in that sense. Right. The yeah. one thing I tried to do um, was listen to an album enough, listen to music enough that I felt like my judgment of it was going to remain pretty stable over right. time. Right. I feel like it's not that useful to be like, this is amazing, and then six yeah. months later be like, oh, no, I changed my mind. So that was the main thing I tried to focus on and to try to focus on now when I'm, I'm writing about music. Like, this thing that I enjoy, like, have I listened to it enough that I feel like I'm always going to enjoy it? And often now, if I go back to something that I said was not so great that everyone else loves or something that I said was great that, like, no one else cared about, yeah. like, often now, I'm like, yeah, that still sounds pretty good to me or still sounds pretty bad to me. Not always, yeah, yeah, yeah. but often. Well, I think you you, you, uh, um, you were humble enough to admit the, the Beyoncé uh, prediction in the oh, book. Oh yeah, yeah, man! I went that that went viral. <laughs> I wrote this piece, and the, the headline was uh, "What the you, there was the, another the artist Ashanti. that you picked, right? It was the new Ashanti, the new Beyonce. She's no Ashanti, or something. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and the headline just went like for years. It would go like viral again and again, again. on Twitter because yeah, that's like that's ridiculous. Oh, but and yeah. so I thought I thought I owed it to people and to Ashanti and Beyonce themselves. Um, to be, you know, to write a, a bit in the book about like how I arrived at that judgment sure. and what was what was and wasn't smart about it. But yes, that you know that absolutely comes with the territory. And I think there is at different times in my life, I've thought differently about like disagreement. And then the mm. way I, the reason I say that is because like in the 1990s, when I was deep into the world of like hardcore punk in Boston, and I was in a collective and we put on concerts and bands came and played. And the whole idea was that everyone was on the same page mm. and that like we had the same ideals. It was like mainly straight edge. It was like almost all vegan, vegetarian. Mm -hmm. It was like super lefty, feminist, pro-gay, pro-choice. And like and we, there was an assumption that, like, we only listened to bands that were on about that stuff. And, like, the record labels that put out the records were about that stuff. And the people who came to the shows, like, everyone was together. And that was really powerful, and that was really intense. And I think there is, there is something to be said about that, just as there is something to be said for being the kind of listener I am now, where, like, I like listening to all sorts of different stuff. Yeah. I like cognitive dissonance. I like going from one world to another. And, you know, those things are are... Some people are kind of symbi symbiotic, which is to say, like, the only reason that a listener like me has the ability of being able to go from one world to another, and you can, like, listen to, like, a country ballad and, like, a new death metal album, and there's a techno set I want to check out, like, the only reason you can do that is because these worlds exist, and these mm. worlds only exist because people want to be inside of them and live their mm. whole lives inside them. You only get that kind of intensity that gives you death metal because there's a bunch of closed-minded people being like, I'm not listening to anything else. We're going to really focus on this one thing. So, so in that sense, I think that I think that both of those things are important. The idea of having these very insular communities and also having some other listeners that are less insular. I say all that just to say that I think we're living in a moment now with social media that really allows people to experience the joys and pleasures of like-mindedness. Mm. The pleasure of feeling like everyone is on the same page, right? Like, we're all on this. We're, we're not listening to that person. Mm. Everyone knows that person is great, right? Like, that's the in the in the Beyonce years, right? Like, that's part of the joy of be the Beyonce years is like, everyone agrees. And like, <laughs> the president loves Beyonce <laughs> and the indie rock band loves Beyonce. Yeah, and yeah. like, no one's going to say anything bad about Beyonce. And, and you see that more broadly now. Like, I'm trying to imagine what it would look like for a mainstream outlet to publish – 
a review saying that BTS was lousy. Mm. Right. It's hard to even imagine. It would be an. It would be literally an international incident. Yeah. Oh sure. And it's hard to imagine what that would be like. Right. So it's a moment that really you see and and you know there's something fun about that there's something fun about the idea of like yeah we're riding into battle we're all together <laughs> but there's also some stuff that you're going to miss out on and yeah. there is something to be said also for you know a kind of a crankier moment and a moment that is is more likely to sell, to tolerate and even celebrate dissent and disagreement. And I think I think somewhere in there, right? And I, I think that tension always exists in music because that tension reflects the two things that music is really good at, is, is really good at reflecting that kind of communal sense of like, I'm part of something. Mm. And that's something you see very much on social media. And it's also good at helping you differentiate yourself, distinguish yourself from other people and say like, I'm not like those people over there. And I think that push-pull, you know, and I think those things are, are in, in some sense, um, incompatible. And the fact that they're incompatible is why our musical discussions are never quite settled because the things we're asking popular music to do are kind of incompatible with each other. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I think that's one of the things that, that makes it interesting and that's what that's what makes me look at the current moment that that uh, you know prioritizes agreement and and makes me think about the ways in which maybe the next moment will be a moment that celebrates dissent and disagreement. What a what a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks. Uh, congratulations. This is fun. Yeah. Oh, I've been having a blast. Uh, congratulations on the book, by the way. It is it is a hundred percent essential reading for our listeners, and it's awesome. It's been on our website, otherrecordlabels.com slash books as a recommended. I know people have picked it up. Uh, it, it's such a great book. So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much. This was great. To get your copy of Caliphasena's book, Major Labels, go to otherrecordlabels.com slash books. That's otherrecordlabels.com slash books, where I keep a list of all of my favorite music industry and business books there. And you'll find this book right there on the homepage. You can click through for your chance to buy it. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you to Kelifa for being on the show, for being so wise and so generous with his time. And I really do hope you check out this book. And I hope that you have found it helpful on your journey of running an independent record label or being an independent musician in the music industry. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>